Hey Rex, what are you doing? I'm trying to figure out a way to intro our video. Why don't you just tell them that we're leader? And there's six of us. Mention that it's a campus style development. Make sure you say that it's in East Victoria Park. And that it's all nice timber. But how do I put that all together in a non-cringy way? So going into our capstone, our group challenged ourselves to define a scope that was complex enough to reflect on our development in the past 18 months, while allowing us to explore new systems and construction practices in Calgary. All the issues we identified mainly stem from an increase in the urban sprawl, which is causing a strain on our infrastructure and city services, leading to a negative impact on our environment. Our solution is a large mixed-use development which consists of multiple buildings. These campus-style clusters typically contain a form of residential and commercial spaces, and sometimes even rec centers. Think of something like a vacation resort or Olympic Village located close to downtown Calgary, where the people in and around the area don't have to travel far to access services. We explored various sites around the city that would be suitable for our development, and we ended up examining two central infill locations and one new location on the outskirts of the city. Since we wanted to maximize the lead credits we get for our development, we selected this site located in East Victoria Park downtown. It is currently underutilized and offers a great location for transit access and nearby amenities. The City of Calgary's Rivers District Master Plan outlines this area to be redeveloped into a mixed-use residential and low-rise commercial area. It will tie into the planned river walk, and following the advice of one of our industry advisors at CMLC, we made sure to incorporate multiple access points from the pathway into our site. With help from our advisor at Jamin Homes, we were also able to visit Westman Village, located in South Calgary, and we used it as an excellent case study as a fully realized site that provides its residents with office, retail, and amenity services all in one place. With this information, we moved into design development, and we created numerous massing iterations that would make the best use of our selected site. Our project heavily relies on BIM to allow us to work efficiently as a team. We have used Revit to construct our models and to create our deliverables. We utilize Revit cloud sharing because it allowed us to collaborate efficiently and effectively while learning valuable new tools. We decided to create our own custom Revit template for our project models. Although it took quite a while to make, it saved us valuable time as we avoided searching for and creating new families. Our custom template was then applied to all of our Revit models. Along with our template, we created a leader drafting standard. We took the time to come up with a document that outlined drafting techniques that we used to increase quality and cohesiveness across all of our drawing packages. Here you can see how we broke down the development into separate models to make it more manageable. Each primary building is essentially composed of a structural and architectural model, along with a separate model for the parkade. Because of this, we ended up having 14 models, including the site file. We chose to use this system because it avoids overcrowding a certain model, and it also gives us good practice using tools that were new to us. When it came to building programming, uh, what we want to do is make sure that different uses uh, fit well within our buildings. To make sure we could do this properly, what we did was do a lot of different case studies, analyze floor plans, and take different measurements. Uh, from there, we put our research into Revit as massings and move those massings around with different iterations. Um, we did notice as we got a little further into the developing phase uh, that these uh, sizes were getting a little bit large and our buildings were getting closer and closer to each other. Uh, this meant we had to make sure we communicated very well uh, when it came to um, where our buildings were located uh, for the purpose of making sure that our spatial separations were on par and that fire wasn't going to be able to uh, move from building to building. Our plan was to not only build this development that we conceptualized and masked out, but we wanted to build it in a way that reshaped and changed the typical design and construction, especially here in Calgary. With the sustainably managed forest as a tool in Canada's backyard, we challenged ourselves to design an environmentally friendly building by producing a mass timber structure and compare it to its concrete and steel counterparts. Our intent was showcasing mass timber construction as less of a foreign element and more of a primary resource in construction. After the decision to use mass timber, we realized that none of us had any experience with this type of construction. As a case study, we used the Brock Commons at UBC in Vancouver. This was a great example to model off of, as it was an 18-story mass timber building in Canada. They used glue lamp posts and cross-laminated timber floors for the structure. This we copied into our residential tower. And as for the shorter buildings, we based our structures from the little that we had learned and some guidance from our industry advisors at StructureLamp. One issue we ran into early on was the tight column spacing. Due to the way that CLT floors are constructed, they can only span in small lengths and widths. This narrowed down our grid spacing to about two by six meters, and the columns were also dimensionally bigger 
than we are used to to support the loads. This also made space planning a lot more difficult with all the tightly based columns. However, there was another issue that the Brock Commons had already solved that was a major roadblock for the rest of our project. What we didn't realize until our advisors at Structureland pointed out was that Brock Commons was given a special variance to be constructed and the current stand data wouldn't allow for combustible construction above 12 stories. Our instructors gave us two options, take the building down in size or go through the work and research to apply for alternative solution. One thing we knew is the whole idea was to explore the full spectrum of possibilities with mass timber. Recognizing its importance as a Canadian resource, we wanted to learn what it would take to design bigger and taller mass timber structures. Another of our advisors, Ba at Santec, showed us the application process with the City of Calgary for applying for a variance, so we got to work. Aside from filling out the city form, applying for a variance involves analyzing the code, the specific functional and objective statements that pertain to non-combustible construction in order to propose an alternative solution that would provide the same or better performance. In this case, the concern was a risk of harm of occupants or the structure from flames spreading beyond its point of origin. Which makes sense considering what we know about how mass timber performs with respect to fire ratings. If you throw a full log on a fire, it's going to take hours to burn, but the surface could allow fire to spread. The solution is encapsulation, covering the exposed surfaces of the wood with non-combustible materials such as concrete or gypsum. We went through the code, line by line, looking for anything related to combustible construction, and we drafted our own regulations that would replace those items. Obviously, a sprinkler system would be mandatory to prevent flame spread. Combustible cladding would be, require very strict limits to not span long distances across the exterior of the building. The fire resistance rating developments needed to be improved beyond the minimums, and we wouldn't permit any concealed spaces that could encourage flame spread. Not only that, we had to think about how the building would be built. We had to ensure an adequate water supply would be available during construction, and that only four stories could be constructed at once before they require encapsulation. On the northwest side of our site, we located our mixed-use podium and residential towers to prevent our high structure from casting shadows onto the river. Shown here on our DP floor plan, we have our spaces dedicated to retail uses highlighted in red, residential in blue, and supermarket in yellow, which all connect to the common garbage area in green. Careful planning needed to go into how these large spaces were placed in relation to one another and what uses needed to be located facing the elements around the site. After conducting numerous case studies to ensure our podium had the proper sizes and dimensions for our uses, our large grocery store took shape fronting the future busy commercial street. On the northeast side of the podium, we placed our proposed retail storefronts to face the future transit green line. We mistakenly anticipated that we would have 100% allo allowable unprotected openings, but with our limited distance being quite small, we had to cut some of our storefront glazing dimensions in half to remain compliant with the NBC. And finally, on the southeast side of the podium, we placed two lobbies for the residential towers above and seven townhomes that face the inner courtyard to mitigate sounds from the trains to the north side for the occupants on the ground floor. A product of us exploring new systems and pursuing lead credits was designing a green roof system to maximize our green space. Indicated by the blue lines in this detail, the vapor barrier remains on the warm side of the insulation throughout, while the air barrier runs up and over the parapet and back down to be adhered to the protected roof membrane under the roof insulation. When solving our control layer continuity, we always reviewed how it would be constructed and its order of assembly. This construction animation we created shows that in order to wrap the vapor barrier around the concrete slab and adhere to the roof membrane, the parapet would have to be erected after its application. And only then can you apply the air barrier, the green roof assembly, exterior wall insulation, cladding, and required flashings. Our residential building is composed of two towers, the west being Skyline Peak and the east is Skyline River. Along with the podium townhomes, the entire building is composed of 255 units that include one, two, and three bedroom dwellings. The towers are connected with four levels above the podium and the entire residential building is made up of three unique floor plans. We tried our best to maintain a very simple floor to floor layout so we can neatly stack identical units. However, it didn't really work out quite as simple as we hoped. We intended on having around three or four unique units, but after running into some small issues, we had to create new unit plans with minor tweaks. Due to the repetitive nature of the towers, we took advantage of the group tool in Revit to save a lot of time. Here you can see the six main unit designs that make up the residential towers. 
In these views, you can really gain an understanding of how huge the mass timber columns are and how we had to design around them. The top floor of each tower is the penthouse level with four large units. Here are some interior shots of one of the three bedroom penthouse units. Shown here is a large kitchen that is open to the living room, the master bedroom with balcony access, and the spacious ensuite adjacent to the master bedroom. So one of the more challenging details was the balcony connection on the residential towers. Because we're using CLT panels for the floor, we have chosen to cantilever the panels to create the balcony structure. The first important consideration was how the air vapor barrier will maintain its continuity at this location. Here you can see how it goes all the way around the outside of the CLT panel and it ties into the door sill and the exterior wall below. Next, we had to figure out how to attach the decorative white panels on the edge of the balcony. We used a knife plate to attach the steel stud structure to the CLT because it creates a gap for drainage. The white metal panels are then attached to the steel stud structure and protected with pre-finished steel flashing. The Amenity Centre at Riverside Square was a great reminder about how important case studies are to architectural design. None of us had ever designed anything like it. Thankfully, our advisor, Jamin, was incredibly helpful by walking us through the design of, as well as physically walking us through, the amenity center over at Westman Village in Mahogany. Trying to coordinate a variety of uses in one building took a great deal of effort, but we managed to design a cohesive building that includes a convenient daycare, a pool and a fitness center, with full changing facilities and a sauna on the main floor, as well as gymnasium and multiple meeting slash activity rooms on the second floor. Because we didn't have to worry about fire ratings or encapsulation for this building, we experimented with using CLT panel exterior walls. The CLT added additional RSI and removed the thermal bridging caused by steel framing. Additionally, leaving the interior of the walls exposed would visually highlight the stunning qualities of wood construction. The parkade underwent a fair amount of design and space planning as well. The floor plan of P1 is a good visual to see how this is all laid out. The teal blue is a commercial parking lot. The darker blue is a residential parking lot for P1. In total, we have 189 parking stalls and six designed for persons with disabilities. This allows for three quarters of the 255 dwelling units to have parking. The green room above the main core will provide 126 class one bike stalls, ensuring that half of the dwelling units will get full-time bike parking. And the little purple leg on the east side will be an exit into the courtyard used to access the commercial spaces. P2 has a very similar layout and makes up the rest of the residential stalls. All of the floors are sloped to central drains to allow for water to get out when needed. The 4% graded floor shown here will allow for efficient parking layout as well as a gradual path down to P2 without the use of big long ramps. The roof of the parkade provides the floor for the amenity center and podium, however also holds the grade on some points for the site. This means we're separating conditioned space from semi-conditioned space and outdoor space. This transition needed to be more than one continuous slab. As you can see here, we just needed to lower the parkade and step the transfer slab to leave room for the insulation and control layers, but also leave room for the grade and sidewalks above the roof of the parkade. Our mass timber commercial buildings presented unique challenges due to their designs. When we started detailing our buildings, we knew we'd have to pay extra attention to certain areas and found that building them in 3D helped us envision how they would go together while also providing extra clarity for the construction plans. We really want to keep the original design of our roofs to evoke the river and tie all of our buildings together visually. So we invested in different roofing types and we were able to source some metal roofing tiles that can follow the curves and provide a pleasing aesthetic to our roofs. Having multiple buildings, we were also able to share some construction details and assemblies amongst them. We were able to utilize Revit to create a library of shared details and incorporate them into the different drawing packages. This detail here shows how our masonry walls interface with curtain walls while allowing the beauty of the natural timber columns of the structure to show. This is the restaurant. This building aims to attract people up the river walk as well as to accommodate the local residents. On the main floor, we have an F2 brewery as well as an A2 tap room. The second floor has an A2 restaurant. One of our goals with this project was to focus on thermal performance. We did this by making sure all of our assemblies exceeded the minimum requirements in the energy code. To do this, we had to understand the nominal resistance as well as the conductivity of different elements within the assemblies. We then did the RSI and U-value calculations based off the initial assembly we pulled from the BC Hydro. We then took these assemblies, used them with the trade-off method to compare our proposed versus reference building. We also had to consider the locations where beams penetrated through the building envelope, and this was done by taking the thermal performance of Glulam from the NBC. 
Due to the curvature in a roof, we have to use some unconventional systems to ensure constructability is still possible. Our roof is similar to a wall assembly. It uses semi-rigid insulation as well as metal to ensure that we can maintain continuity of control layers while having a curved roof. The curve also means that we can have a peripheral gutter drain rather than a central drain. We need to use snow stops as well as an extended fascia to ensure that snow and water stop and go into the gutter rather than going over the edge. Because the curtain wall cannot fasten to a level deck, we have to use fasteners that can connect the bean directly to the vertical mullions. At this location, the air vapor barrier is allowed to pass between the conditioned and unconditioned roof deck. These will then be fastened to one another after the membrane has been applied. We did a building lifecycle lead credit that allowed us to compare different structural elements and see their environmental impact. We noticed that mass timber reduces global warming and is also a great renewable resource compared to concrete and steel. However, it did have a downfall called eutrophication. This happens at the end of the life cycle when nitrogen is released into bodies of water, creating algae blooms that lead to a decrease in oxygen and that ends up killing aquatic life. In Calgary, we have to ask ourselves, is this a worthwhile trade-off for mass timber? For a project of this size, we wanted an efficient layout of sheets for cartoon set. Our goal was to tackle it with a unified drawing set to aim for a more consistent collective drawings. So we did this by making one package that contains all of the info sheets at the beginning and then later moved into separate construction drawing sets for each of the buildings, which are labeled with a letter and corresponding page numbers to follow. This summed up all of our drawings into a one 150 page drawing set for the entire development to tie it all together. To conclude, we'd like to thank Will, Lindsay, and all of the past instructors that we've had throughout the program. The main takeaway from working on this project is that we couldn't have done it without a great group of guys that know how to work hard and know how to have a good time.